Hi everyone and welcome to a new episode in the Multiverse video series. Today we're going to learn about distributed deep learning. Now to be fair, distributed deep learning is a quite broad topic and I'm not going to be able to absolutely teach everything and also perform code exercises and why not in this first video. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to cover our basis, we're going to cover the technologies, and we're going to review the literature that is relevant to training uh, deep learning models across multiple machines. All right, so the first question is, why should we care about distributed deep learning, right? And I find that the best way of answering this question is to take a look at uh, OpenAI's blog post on AI and compute. This is a blog post from around 2018. And uh, what it puts together is a chart and some data that shows kind of like, if you take a look at what are the state of the art deep learning models, what does it take to train them in terms of hardware and computation cost? So, you know, on the x-axis, you can see that there is the time, the year in which the deep learning model was trained. And on the y-axis, just the petaflops, petaflops to give you some sense of how much compute do you need to train those models? Now, I have a modified version of this diagram in the Mastering Spark with R book. And uh, the chart looks like this. It's the same data, but what I did was uh, to chart uh, in uh, gray the models that require a single computer and with black the models that require more than one computer. So for instance, you can see here that uh, training the deep, le uh, deep learning AlexNet model which if you remember from uh, the introduction to deep learning video was one of the first models that proved successful in image classification competitions. So this particular model was trained with only one computer. And as you can see here, uh, across the, you know, from all the way from 2010 to all the way to 2016, most of the state of the art models required a single computer and GPU. Now, if you look at more recent models like AlphaGo and uh, OpenAI's Dota 1 versus 1 and the neural architecture search uh, models, they all require more than one computer. So using a single GPU was not enough, but we actually had to, to use more than one computer and more, multiple GPUs to train these particular models. So I think this is why it's relevant. Now, it might not be relevant in 2020, but maybe 2021 or 2022, like starts to become more common to train these uh, deep learning models at scale. So I want you to give you the tools kind of like to figure out how to do that and what you need to learn to be successful in training models at scale. So uh, the first step, what I, would do, what I would do is literally just search TensorFlow and distributed computing. And it's very likely that you're gonna arrive to this, uh, this page, which is the official you know, distributed training strategies for TensorFlow. And uh, what I found a little bit confusing from this particular page is that um, in TensorFlow terminology, what they call distributed is not what I consider distributed. So for instance, if you're training a model in four GPUs on a single computer, in, ter in, in TensorFlow terminology, that would be called distributed computing, uh, mostly because you have multiple GPUs and you still need to do similar a similar level of synchronization that you know like you would have to do anyways with distributed computing uh, but to me like that's not exactly doesn't necessarily fit the definition of distributed computing anyways so you can take a look at uh, the different strategies that we have here and you know you're going to see one that is called mirror mirror strategy which only happens to work for a single computer with multiple gpus so we're going to skip that for this particular uh video there's another one called a TPU strategy, which again, it's useful when you have more than one tensor processing unit. Um, and again, I don't consider it really distributed computing. Uh, the one that is definitely used when you have more than one computer is the multi-worker mirror strategy. So we're gonna take a deep look into where does this particular strategy come from and when is it good to use it and why not? Uh, central storage strategy uh, helps you do a combination of CPU and GPU on a single machine. And again, it's not something that I consider distributed computing. And then there's the parameter server strategy, which we'll use uh, to train um, in multiple machines. So this one is also going to be relevant. And the last one is the one device strategy, which is basically just using a single GPU. And, you know, is the one that we're all of usually used to using when dealing with TensorFlow. <clears throat> 
Now, just as a very general overview, you can think about the mirror strategy and the parameter server as synchronous and asynchronous training. Uh, so for synchronous training, it means that there's some coordination going between the worker nodes. And, you know, like it's, um, you know, it requires coordination and it requires you to kind of like face those operations um, in an orchestrated way. Now for asynchronous training, it basically means that uh, when you train, you don't need to worry as much about synchronous, synchronizing the workers and each of them can do their own pace while training. Now, uh, when I read this, it wasn't still clear to me exactly what's the difference between synchronous and asynchronous. It kind of makes sense on a conceptual level, but I wanted to figure out exactly what's the difference between them. So um, one way of taking a look at this is just to take a step back. And uh, there is a great paper uh, called Large Scale Distributed Deep Networks from Google. Uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff Dean is the, one of the authors, which you might remember from the MapReduce uh, paper and video that we uh, take a look at in Introduction to Distributed Computing. And uh, basically in this particular paper, um, you know, first of all, you need to understand that um, this was um, a paper released in 2012. So this was way before TensorFlow and way before we have really computational graph frameworks to use. So it's, it's, it was a while ago, but what is pretty interesting is that it solved a lot of the problems on distributed computing that we're facing today. And uh, yeah, so um, here, what you can see here is a chart, uh, a, a graph that represents kind of like how distributed training works. Now, if we were solving this problem on our own, we can follow a similar strategy than the strategy that we follow with Apache Spark, which is if you have a lot of data, you can split it into multiple machines. Each machine processes one part of the data set and then uh, there's a process that joins and aggregates the um, the results um, in deep learning you might have data that fits into one machine but usually you still want to distribute the, the data across multiple machines because uh, the modeling process it's can take so long that it makes sense to split the data in a similar way that what we do with uh, just in general distributed computing with apache spark anyway so uh, that's what we have here we have model replicas where each of the compute models basically has a subset of the data. So if you were to have, you know, 16 million images, you can split, split them into three computers with each computer having, you know, like 4 million images or whatever, or you can have 300 computers or why not? So you split the data and then you can train the data on each node quite easily, right? You can run an R script with TensorFlow and train the model on those particular nodes. Uh, that's that's not a problem at all. Now, the problem is like you don't want to have three or 300 different models. You want to have like a single trained model for the entire data set. So the way that um, this paper solves the problem is by introducing the concept of a parameter server. So a parameter server is another computer or a set of different computers that have the role of keeping track of the weights of the neural network in a centralized location. So when, uh, when a particular worker finishes computing um, training, it can send the, uh, the weights to the centralized server and the centralized server can then communicate to all the worker nodes again what is the updated uh, state of the model. Now you can be a little bit smarter and rather than sending the entire uh, collection of weights, usually when you're doing gradient descent, you know, like not the entire model changes. So you can just change, you can send the delta, which is what the, uh, this particular uh, uh, diagram is showing. It only, it's, only show, it's only sending the difference, the delta between the current weights and the modified weights. So that helps a lot and reduces bandwidth and why not. And then again, once the server has, uh, you know, these updated weights, the server can send again the updated weights to all the clients. And then, you know, like you can, you can train in parallel since the weights are being shared. Now, they make, this makes a lot of sense, but if you think about this, there is like one corner case, right? And it's, uh, it's if you have 300 machines, it, it's going to be the case that at some point, two machines are going to decide to modify the same neuron um, with different values, right? So suppose that one, you know, one machine could be sending a value of updating a particular connection in a particular layer for a, ne for a neuron to a value of, say, like uh, 0.01, and another uh, layer, uh, another node might be modifying the same neuron with a connection between layers with a value of 
negative 0.1 and they would cancel each other out right so in theory in theory this could break right like you know if 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 they're overlapping like that could potentially cause some issues and it's actually pretty cool that um if you look at this at, at the paper they're actually acknowledging that this could be a problem right so uh, it actually says uh from the paper uh because the parameter server shards are independently uh, act independently. There is no guarantee that at any given moment the parameters of each shard of the parameter server have undergone the same number of updates or that the updates were applied in the same order. Moreover, because the model replicas are permitted to fetch parameters and push gradients in separate threads, there may be additional subtle inconsistencies in the timestamps of the parameters. So again, like you're updating stuff and since we're not synchronizing the, uh, how we, ex you know, like to prevent Two nodes from updating the parameter server at the same time there could be inconsistencies now i think this is this is the most relevant part of the paper at least from my point of view it says uh, there is little theoretical grounding for the safety of these operations for non-convex problems but in practice we found relaxing consistency requirements to be remarkably effective so it's, they're basically saying is like well you know like this obviously you know like it's you know this obviously has a side effect but it happens to work out, you know, and then you can think like, well, why is it working out? And, um, you know, like if you think about it, like when you initialize a neural network, you start with random weights. So there's there's random weights across the entire network, across all the, you know, like on, on the across all the instances. And but not only that, but usually when you're training, you use something like a stochastic gradient descent, which happens to be stochastic, meaning random. So, you know, like the process of training a neural network is not deterministic anyways, right? And, you know, like is resilient, you know, to some level of changes and errors and is stochastic. So this basically means, you know, like if you end up having, if you end up having this case where two different uh, computers computing the model, like end up updating the gradient in opposite directions, sure, that's going to happen and it's going to cancel each other out. But since finding the gradient is stochastic, you know, you might as well consider that random noise, right? And it doesn't happen usually very often if you have an ef efficient system that is, you know, like implemented and well implemented and fast. So even if it happens, it's not something to worry about. And it's something that the paper, uh, this original paper from Jeftin in 2012 already found out that it's okay. And, you know, it's not a big deal. Yeah, so I think that this is really cool because it basically allows us to train deep learning models uh, this in a distributed fashion without having to worry too much about consistency. Now, the next paper is uh, that I would like to show is basically the TensorFlow paper, uh, large scale machine learning uh, on heterogeneous distributed systems. And I'm pretty sure we might have already reviewed this paper, you know, for the other benefits of TensorFlow, like uh, being having automatic differentiation and a computation graph that simplifies the work that we do and avoiding us to having to write manual CUDA code and why not. Uh, the part that we haven't reviewed from the paper is uh, the, its distributed computing aspect. So from the beginning, um, TensorFlow already supported an asynchronous data processing pattern and some level of synchron synchronicity as well. But in both cases, there used to be a parameter server. Uh, so you can see here, actually, in the paper, it's called a parameter device, but it's basically the same as a parameter server. And kind of like the evolution between, you know, like the previous 2012 paper to this one is that TensorFlow adds a lot of like great features that make it make it really easy to write models, right? So we don't need to be writing low level C++, C or C++ code with low level networking as Jeff uh, had probably to do. Um, in this case, we can simply rely on TensorFlow to distribute computation and write high level code and auto differentiate and all this greatness. And, you know, and again, distributed processing, you know, was performing TensorFlow using a parameter server. So, so far, that's great. I think we understand pretty well what asynchronous means, you know, like each model, it's each model in each worker node is computing its own parameters and then sending them to the parameter server. Sure, there might be some overlap and some noise, but we can, you know, like write it, write it off and whatever, right? Like it, it just doesn't really matter. Now, the next paper I want to show, um, it's uh, the Horobot paper, which is a fast and easy distributed deep learning in TensorFlow. Now, uh, actually, most of the credit for the particular algorithm doesn't go, you know, doesn't go to the Horobot system, but rather from a different paper from 2007 that Baidu published. And um, it's kind of like a change of strategies. Rather, rather than having a parameter server, which, you know, like whenever, whenever you have distributed computing and whenever you have a centralized 
process or a centralized machine, like that's usually bad because um, it's just a bottleneck when you're updating things. So um, the way that the Baidu paper proposes doing this uh, distributed deep learning is uh, rather to follow what they called a uh, ring all reduce strategy. So basically that means that instead of sending the weights to the parameter server, you all you do is you have a synchronous step where you say like everyone wait, uh, we need to synchronize our parameters. And basically each worker node sends their parameter to their neighboring worker node. And then you each, each worker node creates an average of the gradient. So you're basically passing along kind of like uh, you know, like a message with the gradients and each worker node is updating their gradients and computing the average and passing it along. And you kind of like repeat these for, uh, for all the worker nodes. And kind of like this is what the diagram shows. It basically starts on one worker node and then it propagates the gradient across all of them. And again, this, is, this also happens to be a more effective strategy than having a centralized server. And in addition, you know, uh, what Horobot brings is uh, an implementation on TensorFlow it also adds support for this uh, ring all reduce strategy, and it adds a few additional improvements like using NVIDIA's NCCL technology, uh, which is a library for collective communication, uh, collective communications, which uh, basically implements uh, kind of like all these strategies of um, of um, you know uh, transmitting information, which in, in the case of Horobot is used to transfer the gradient across different nodes, and it's just very efficient and you know optimized. It also runs on you know like InfiniBand, like basically uh, you know like over gigabyte networks, and you know like I think they're up to like fifty gigabyte or hundred gigabyte networks or whatever. Uh, so it, it basically is super optimized for network. Uh, transfer and you know like really low level and really fast so i kind of they kind of put together all these things together into kind of like a framework that uses tensorflow uh, it's easy to use and uh, it also supports this uh, ring over your strategy uh, curious note uh, the horobot project happens to be a linux foundation project under ai and um, it is my hope that um, since we've been uh, using sparkly r across these videos to use Apache Spark with R. Sparkly R happens to be also on the Linux Foundation under the AI umbrella. So it's definitely uh, something that I'm looking forward to kind of like figure out how we can do distributed processing, uh, not just in R, but also in, in Apache Spark. So I, I owe that video. Now, uh, kind of like to wrap up, I want to come back to um, this guide from TensorFlow where we're, they're explaining what distributed training means. And I feel like now we have a really good understanding of what the two strategies are. So we have the server parameter strategy, which is basically the original Jeff Dean approach of having a, a machine with a, a centralized uh, a copy of the weights that everyone can use as the ground truth. And we have the new strategy, which is the mirror strategy, which happens to use the uh, kind of like ring approach that was proposed in the Baidu paper in 2017. Uh, so a couple more details. If you look at the parameter server strategy, it's currently not supported by Keras. Um, you know, the current statement is that it might be supported after TensorFlow 2.0, and it's all and it also doesn't support custom training loops. Um, so that's kind of like a bummer. But we do know that the ring strategy is better; it's more efficient. It doesn't require a centralized bottleneck, and that's the one that is currently supported. It strictly speaking, it has experimental support. So um, you know. Um, it is what it is, but it actually works and we should be able to use experimental support with Keras for a multi-worker mirrored strategy, which uses the uh, ring all reduce uh, approach. And it also supports custom training loops. So anyways, you know, even though there's two strategies, uh, parameter server and the mirror strategy, we really want to use the multi-worker mirror strategy anyways. Um, so that's all good. We have the tools that we need to perform um, distributed training with uh, TensorFlow and R. Uh, however, we're going to take a look at that on a separate video. Um, in the meantime, I hope that this video was useful to you and give you kind of like the concepts that you need to know when uh, thinking of doing distributed training, kind of like why you need to want to do distributed training, um, you know, uh, since it's becoming more relevant and kind of like the approaches that we have and how they're actually implemented. So again, uh, thanks for watching this video and uh, we'll keep you posted.